back, everyone. I hope, uh, I hope that you had a good lunch and that you are prepared for the afternoon's speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Mariel Watts. Mariel works primarily for the Pesticide Action Network. She coordinates PAN Aotearoa, New Zealand, and is a senior technical advisor to PAN Asia and the Pacific. She is also a co-chair of the international IPEN networks, uh, the Pesticide Working Group. Together, these two networks include over 1,000 civil society organizations. Miro represents them on all pesticide matters at meetings of UN chemicals conventions and other international agreements. She has also had a long involvement in New Zealand's organic sector, including being director of the Soil and Health Association and runs a small certified organic farm on Waiheke Island. She is also the author of books on pesticides and breast cancer and on the effects of pesticides on children. Both of these books are available here at the conference. She is currently working on one about replacing highly hazardous pesticides with agroecology. Please join me in inviting Muriel to the stage. Uh, thank you, Jack, and kia ora tato. Um, my thanks to the uh, organisers of this conference for inviting me to speak. I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to talk about a subject that is dear to my heart. Uh, well, I wish it wasn't really. I'd rather be closer to the organics than the pesticides, but still, somebody has to do this dirty work. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about ecosystem effects, children, uh, the effects of pesticides on children in society. Do we actually need to have pesticides? and why we're in this sad state of affairs. The world is totally drenched in pesticides. In 2013, 2.3 3 million tonnes of pesticides were being applied. And by 2019, it's projected 3.2 million tonnes will be applied every year. So contrary to our expectations when we began doing this work 30, 40 years ago, the amount of pesticides being used is steadily increasing every year. We don't know how many pesticides are actually on the market. There's between one and 2,000 uh, active ingredients. Now we say one and 2,000 because just recently when I was compiling a list of banned pesticides globally, we found pesticides being banned in China that we didn't know even existed. China is manufacturing pesticides that nobody else knows about. So it's a bit of a guess as to how many pesticides there really are out there now. Uh, as for formulations, with all those added extra toxic chemicals that we heard about this morning, at least 350,000 uh, formulations in the US. Uh, but again, we have no idea of the total. Uh, for example, in China alone, there's 1,000 formulations just for uh, chlorpyrifos, and there's more than 1,000 for glyphosate. The value of these, $76 billion estimated by 2019, and that gives us a clue as to why we're having such a problem. This is a hugely wealthy business that we're dealing with. So not surprisingly, every part of the environment is contaminated. The soil, of course, and rivers, of course, we, we're aware of that. The sea, the rain, the snow, fog, ice, the air above the um, Arthur's Pass in the Southern Alps has got chlorpyrifos in it, from its use in the Canterbury Plains. And the air all around the world contains uh, pesticides. Some of the worst contaminated air is actually in Tasmania, in a very remote part in southern Tasmania, because it kind of collects the air currents from all over the southern hemisphere, draws all the pesticides into southern Tasmania. But the air in Delhi is very polluted, not with diesel fumes, but with pesticides as well. So these pesticides are in the air everywhere. They're in the bark of trees, the grass is high in Himalayas, throughout the Arctic and throughout the Antarctic. So there's not one part of our environment anymore that's not contaminated. In terms of adverse effects on people, uh, people tend to think first of cancer. And we heard about cancer this morning, and it's very important. Um, and there's plenty of cancer going around, but there's probably not many of you realise that there are 99 pesticides currently on the market that are implicated in causing breast cancer. Uh, mo most of those, about 40, 40 or 50 of those are still used in New Zealand, and that includes glyphosate, not the Roundup, so, I mean Roundup, yes, as we saw from those tumours, but also glyphosate itself causes breast cancer cells to grow. 
that, chem that herbicide so beloved of this country. But I've only got 20, 30 minutes to talk about all the effects of pesticides on the environment and, and human health, and that's impossible. So I'm going to cut to the heart of the matter. What I see is the most important things at all, how they're wrecking our ecosystem and how they are wrecking the future of humanity. Not that wrecking the ecosystem is not going to wreck the future of humanity, but I'm talking specifically about our children and their potential for learning and for social interaction with other children, with other humans, our social potential as human beings. These subtle effects are not as visible as birth defects and Parkinson's, but they should be of the utmost concern to us. And I'll also be referring very specifically to a small group of chemicals, the neonicotinoid insecticides, otherwise known as the neonix, because I struggle to pronounce it, and uh, also the organophosphate uh, chlorpyrifos, and you'll see why I particularly picked that one out as we go on. Then I will look, as I said, at why, whether we need these things or not. So first to the ecosystem. In, um, Europe can, uh, you can offer us a glimpse through a window of the ecosystem effects we're likely to be facing, or already are facing, if we continue to use pesticides the way we already are, or the way they have been doing over the last um, three decades, and fail to heed their warnings. In 2009, a group of entomologists and ornithologists came together in a small village in the south of France um, to discuss what they regarded as the catastrophe of the decline in insects and arthropods, other arthropods all over Europe. This had been going on in a gentle way since about 1950s when pesticides were really starting to be introduced. And also there was a loss of, huge loss of habitat for, for insects and birds. Uh, but from the 1990s onwards, there was a very noticeable, sharp, rapid decline in the amount of insects available and an even sharper decline in the uh, populations of insect-eating birds. And this coincided with the introduction of the systemic insecticides, the neonics, and also another one called fipronil. From this meeting emerged an international task force known as the uh, Worldwide Integrated Assessment of uh, Systemic Pesticides. And they carried out a four-year process of reviewing 1,121 1, uh, scientific peer-reviewed papers, 29 scientists involved from 15 countries. And the assessment was published late last year and early this year. In fact, some of the papers are still being published, but the results became known last year. So neonicotinoids are um, neurotoxins. They bind to the receptors in the central nervous system, and at low levels, they cause a superstimulation of the nervous system. But at higher levels, they cause paralysis and death. Fipronil is not a neonicotinoid, but is very similar to a neonicotinoid. <coughs> so the two main neonics that we have in this country, or actually um, um, worldwide, are imidacloprid, and there's a couple of um, trade names for them, and clothianidin. There are other ones, but these are the two that are, that are primarily being used. They're the most common ones. And in fact, um, they're most commonly used as seed dressings here and everywhere else in the world. They protect the seed in the soil, and as the plants start to grow, they are taken up by the roots of the plant, and they are taken right throughout the plant, so every part of the plant becomes toxic to every creature that eats or drinks from that plant. The most widely used insecticide in the world, and New Zealand's no exception. Here we commonly use them for um, our pasture grasses and clovers, uh, corn seed, maize seed, and a whole range of other seeds, including probably home garden seeds. Now we say probably because there's a major hole in our New Zealand regulatory system that allows seeds to be treated with whatever, but does not require them to be labelled. Some years ago when I was working with Sue Kedgley, I try we tried to find out uh, what the seeds in New Zealand are being treated with. And we, I rang all the seed companies in New Zealand. Not one single seed company would identify which of the neonicotinoids were used on their seeds um, or, or the other pesticides as well. So what we have the situation is of farmers and um, unfortunately a lot of home gardeners sowing seeds in their garden, planting seeds in their gardens that are poisoning everything that comes in contact with those plants. And the farmers and particularly the home gardeners have no idea that this is going on. So what did the worldwide impact, uh, impact assessment find? Well, for first of all, they found that these are highly toxic pesticides. Uh, clothianidin is 10, 10,800 times more toxic than DDT. And we know that DDT can kill just about everything that it touches. One seed coated with an neonic can kill a bird. 
and we have these seeds being sown all over New Zealand every year. They persist in the soil for years. The half-life of imidacloprid is three years, up to three years. That means that after three years, half of the imidacloprid is still present in the soil. And after 19 years, it can still be found in the soil. And each year, farmers are adding more and more with their seeds. So the levels in soils are building up and up and up. Not only that, they are highly, they're highly soluble in water and highly mobile in the environment. So they're washing into the groundwater, they're washing into streams or into the runoff. And so we have escalating every year more and more and more contamination of water sources. Just about every water body in the world now is probably contaminated with uh, these neonicotinoids. We know that in the Netherlands, the levels are so high, 25,000 times the ecotox limit, that they can use the water straight out of the river as an insecticide on the plants. Don't have, to, don't have to dilute it by putting an insecticide in it. It's already an insecticide. Um, this is a severe problem because in many of these streams and rivers, biodiversity is vanishing. The, the aquatic invertebrates are vanishing and the wildlife that depends on those, the birds in particular, are also vanishing. So every, as I mentioned, every part of the plant becomes toxic to the insects that, that, that uh, feed on it, that the nectar, the pollen, and the guttation droplets. The guttation droplets are those tiny little droplets of water that are exuded by plants, usually early in the morning, after the osmotic pressure builds up at night. And you see there a picture of a bee drinking on those. Those little droplets of water, which are now dilute solutions of insecticide, are highly um, uh, important for insects for their... Uh, their a water supply. Big problem for bees. I mean, this was mentioned this morning as well. We have, um, as, as everyone has cannot fail to be aware, the problem of colony collapse disorder all around the world. We have huge debates scientifically about what causes it. Is it the pesticides? Is it neonics? Uh, we have a lot of regulatory agencies and chemical companies saying, no, it's not. Prove it that it is. Um, the levels aren't high enough. Um, we have examples of uh, where whole colonies of bees have been lost because the dust blowing off seed drilling operations to the fields next door have wiped out the whole of bees. So, so, so this, these neonics are being spread through the environment, not just by being sown in the soil and not just by spray drift, which is happening, but also dust blowing off seed drilling operations is poisoning uh, bees and other insects. But it's not just the... Um, it's not just the problem of outright mortality. What's really happening with bees, to a great extent, is the, um, it's undermining their immune systems and making them susceptible to pathogens like the nosema and also to the varroa mite, but it's also interfering with their ability to navigate, to learn, to collect food, their longevity, their resistance to disease and, and to fecundity. In other words, their ability to function as bees. The end result, of course, of that is collapsing beehives, uh, loss of pollinator services to farmers, and loss of food supply for the rest of us. These insecticides are also a huge problem to global food production, which they are supposed to be promoting in the first place. Forget, never, never forget that these things are supposed to be produced so that we can have more and better food. And in fact, they're severely undermining the global food production system. And this is because um, they disrupt soil microbial communities and the invertebrates that are the cornerstone of sustainable agriculture. They pose risk to ecosystem functioning and services like leaf litter decomposition, nitrogen fixation, um, so nutrient recycling, carbon storage, biological pest control, pollination services, as I already mentioned, all of which are the cornerstones of our um, agricultural systems here and elsewhere in the globe. And if without, those, without those ecological services, we cannot continue to provide food. There is also a large-scale loss of, of, of biodiversity happening globally. I was reading somewhere recently um, something like one quarter of bird species globally now are uh, faced with extinction. And this has to be one of the causes facing them, partly at direct poisonings, but also that loss of, uh, loss of uh, food supply. But it's not just the birds. It's, they're also a key factor in butterflies, earthworms, and a whole range of, of aquatic species going out of existence. So this is a severe threat to um, bo global biodiversity, also a severe threat to ecosystems underlying our, our agriculture, 
none of this is arriving, arising from accidents where we have large spillages. None of it is arising from what is called misuse. Um, it's arising from ordinary, everyday ev use of an insecticide according to its label instructions, used the way the chemical companies imagined it to be used, used the way our regulators allow it to be used. But because of its nature being so persistent in the soil, persistent in water, and the accumulation that's going on and on, building every year, we're faced with a situation that we've never really been faced with before. And our regulatory system has clearly failed to address this. And we, have, we are really in a situation of massive regulatory failure. The failure is to assess the individual and the joint ecological risks of these chemicals. What happens when there is widespread and simultaneous exposure through, to multiple products, through multiple routes, multiple formulations, multiple modes of action? This is what's really happening out there, not what we get in a regulatory system of one chemical on one organism at one time. But there's also a, a, a massive failure of our regulatory systems here and everywhere in the world to assess the impacts on ecological functioning as a whole and on the ecosystem services as a whole. Um, I'll just divert, I'll digress slightly to refer to glyphosate, one of my other favourite subjects. Um, what didn't get mentioned this morning um, is the impact that glyphosate is having on our aquatic ecosystems. Glyphosate, because it contains a, a phosphate molecule, actually acts as a fertiliser for some species. It, it stimulates their growth as it starts to break down in the, in the aquatic environment. But other species it kills. So it's destabilising the entire marine ecosystem. It's, it's promoting the growth of some species, it's hindering the growth of the others, and the ecosystems in the marine environment are starting to fall over. And strange things are happening in the marine environment that, we, um, that our scientists can't take account of. I don't know if you're aware of... A couple of years ago in Auckland Harbour and in the Haraki Gulf, there was a strange sudden outbreak of poisoning. Dogs being poisoned by eating things that had washed up on the beach, beaches of Auckland. Um, nobody ever got to the bottom of what caused that. At the same time, we were also having quite rather massive algal blooms. And just prior to that, NIWA, the um, National Institute of Water and Atmosphere, had identified glyphosate in its break breakdown product, AMPA, as pesticides of concern because they had found them in quite significant levels of residues throughout the marine sediment in Auckland Harbour. In other words, in Auckland and probably everywhere else, we have quite a, a, a high and ongoing level of uh, contamination with glyphosate, a chemical that destabilises the marine ecosystem and the marine food chain. Now, I don't know if that's what caused whatever happened in the Hauraki Gulf where strange toxins appeared in animals that hadn't had them before. Um, but it's something that needs to be thought about, and our regulators are not thinking about it. Auckland Council doesn't think about it when it decides that it's going to spray all its roadsides with, with glyphosate. In fact, NIWA pointed to roadside spraying with glyphosate as the likely cause of all the residues in Auckland's harbour. But nobody is taking that on board. I do like one of the conclusions of the WIA our inability to learn from our past mistakes is remarkable. You'd think that with our history of DDT use in this country and the problems we still have with it today would have taught us something, but apparently not. So now I'm going to turn briefly to talk about children. And I often preface my um, addresses on children with one of Professor Seralini's comments, because I love it. Our children's bodies have become garbage cans. And it's really true. Our children are now born pre-polluted, as he mentioned, with a whole raft of chemicals, pesticides, flame retardants, and, and, and uh, industrial chemicals. And as a result, children are sicker today than they were a generation ago. Cancers, autism, birth defects, asthma, a whole range of childhood diseases and disorders are on the rise globally. 46 pesticides alone found in placenta, umbilical cord, blood, uh, amniotic fluid and the meconium, that's the firstborn faeces. And that doesn't include all the PCBs and, and flame retardants and all the other chemicals as well. What hope do these kids have of being healthy when they're born, let alone all the chemicals they're then going to face in mother's breast milk and every other bit of food they get to eat from then onwards? From conception unto adolescent, children go through a whole series of um, rapid growth and changes. Their body structures are being formed, their nervous, endocrine, and immune systems in particular are being developed. 
but they're very undeveloped at this stage and they're very, very susceptible to any insults from pesticides and other chemicals. Um, their del delicate, complex developmental processes can be derailed so easily by such incredibly low levels of pesticides, having long-lasting, in fact, lifelong effects on, on their uh, behaviour, growth, intelligence, the ability to, social, to function in society, um, their earning ability, their reproductive ability, and occurrence of disease and disorders. If the brain is exposed to even the minutest levels of neurotoxin at any of these critical points of development, brain development is derailed for life. And this slide illustrates something that in a general sense. This is a, a very famous study that was carried out in Mexico and, and um, published in 1998, a, a group of um, a native uh, um, Indian people in the Yaqui Valley. Uh, and they lived, to, lived together in the valley for generations. They were a genetically homogenous group of people. But around the 1940s, 50s, modern agriculture, so-called, arrived and introduced a huge number of pesticides. Now, a number of people in that, um, that tribe of people did not agree with adding pesticides to agriculture, and they moved themselves from the valley to the foothills. And they stayed in the foothills, and they, they carried out a, 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 a ranching form of agriculture uh, from then onwards, and they did not use pesticides at all. They were still subjected to the government's DDT spraying programs for, for malaria, but, but that was all. So in, in, uh, this, this group of um, scientists carried out a, um, a study of the children and their ability to, their cognitive development and their sociability as well. And you see the results there. The children in the foothills who had, av who had avoided pesticide exposure, they were the same age as the children in the valleys who could not string a coherent picture together. As well as that, the children in the valley were fighting with each other, they were not socialising with each other very well, they couldn't, they couldn't, had no um, fine hand-eye coordination, they couldn't throw a ball properly. The children in the, in the um, foothills who did not have the pesticide exposure, they were very mu much more harmonious in their relationships with each other, there was an absence of aggression, and there was very fine motor, hand motor skills. Just one example, a similar study has in fact been carried out in India, I think in the Punjab region, in the, in the cotton growing belt, um, showing very similar results. I want to focus now on chlorpyrifos, as I um, said I would, because it's one of the worst neurotoxic pesticides we're exposed to. Um, it's in widespread use in New Zealand and around the world. It's been found in umbilical cord blood, meconium, breast milk, children's urine. Um, a number of studies have been carried out in the US, including epidemiological studies in which the children of women who have been exposed to chlorpyrifos during pregnancy have been followed for a number of years. And they keep on, as the children are aging, they keep on putting out a number of studies. Children, th this was a particularly useful um, set of studies, partly because at that stage in the US, chlorpyrifos was allowed to be used in houses. It's not anymore. A couple of countries have managed to ban it from household use, um, South Africa and USA come to mind. I think they're probably the only two that have. New Zealand has kind of semi-regulated it. Um, so, these short, so these women were quite well exposed to chlorpyrifos. And, they, and following it through the children, what these researchers found was that the children whose mothers were exposed had reduced IQ, reduced memory, delayed cognitive development, ADHD and pervasive developmental problems and other attention disorders. Other studies have also shown that chlorpyrifos, prenatal exposure to chlorpyrifos actually alters the structure of the brain. One study found that as little as 4.6 picograms of chlorpyrifos per gram of cord, cord blood during gestation result in a drop of 1.4% of a child's IQ and 2.4% of its working memory. Now, 4.6 picograms is a tiny, minuscule amount of, of chlorpyrifos. Four million times smaller than the residues of chlorpyrifos we have in our food here in New Zealand. Now, clearly, not everything that we get that we eat is going to get absorbed straight into a child's developing brain. But if you have a pregnant mother eating food that's got that level of chlorpyrifos in, which is legally allowed, some of that is finding its way into that child's developing brain. And this matters because a five IQ point drop across a population is equal to a 50% increase in the amount of functionally disabled people and a 50% increase, a decrease in the drop of gift, in gifted people. And across a whole population, that can have actually quite profound implications for our ability to um, be intelligent, for a start. 
Um, I'll come back to that a bit more in a minute. So long-term consequences of, of prenatal exposure to these pesticides um, include things like reduced learning, reduced employment, change, long, lifelong changes in behaviour throughout uh, childhood and adulthood that can range from mild to very debilitating. Social alienation, reduced employment, aggression, followed by higher rates of mental illness and suicide, and increased likelihood of substance abuse and committing crimes later in life. The effects on an individual are pretty devastating. The effects on a population as a whole, well, it's something we're probably actually witnessing in our population to this, at this day. I, I can remember 20 years ago when I was um, working for Greenpeace at that stage on pesticides, and I was approached by a number of farmers' wives who came to me and said, you cannot believe what my husband is like when he comes home after spraying the crops. He is so aggressive. He hits me, he hits the children. He's not like that normally. It's only when he's done the spraying. I can't help but think of the family of, of um, five Indians in, in, out in Bombay in South Auckland, uh, Indian market gardeners, where the husband came home from spraying and actually killed the entire family. Scientists at Harvard School of Public Health have referred to the neurotoxic effects of prenatal exposures to pesticides as a silent pandemic that's affecting the world. So what's the connection between the ecosystem effects of neonicotinoids that I've already talked about and the neurological effects of chlorpyrifos? The answer is regulatory failure. In particular, fail to failure to consider the subtle effects of pesticides. The effects on the developing in the brain of, and the long-term societal effects on the developing brain of chlorpyrifos exposure is no more considered in our regulatory systems than are the ecosystem functioning effects uh, from um, imidacloprid and the other neonicotinoids. So this is a sub, this has a little been a little pastime of mine for many years. I read vast quantities of scientific papers, and always I read the introduction to them very carefully, because always in the introduction, there'll be a statement from otherwise erudite scientists saying things like, pesticides are essential to control diseases and pests to increase food production and improve plant breeds on limited farmland. That was from the Toxicological Research Journal. And then they'll go on with some very good toxicological research. And then they say, here's another one from toxicology. Despite their toxicity and the environmental and health risks they bring about, pesticides are a necessary component of modern agriculture. And without fail, these systems, these, these statements never have a reference. Scientists feel that they can make these statements without referencing because this is received wisdom. Everybody knows we have to have pesticides because we've been told that. And because there's not one single scientific paper I've ever been able to find that proves we need to have pesticides. Not one. And I've looked. Sure, there are papers that show that pesticides kill insects. But then there are lots of other ways of killing insects and managing insects as well. And there's many papers to prove that those other ways can do it better and cheaper than pesticides can, or without all those adverse effects. Here's another um, conclusion from the, um, the assessment uh, that I referred to earlier. Although system systemic pesticides can be highly effective at killing pests, there is clear evidence from some farming systems that current neonicotinoids sorry, can't say that word, neonic use is unnecessary, providing little or no yield benefit. So why are we in the sad state of affairs? Here's a couple of clues. One comes from England. After the UK government did everything it possibly could to stop the EU banning, or and, and actually it turned out a temporary suspension of the neonics, a, um, a British government UK scientist, Dr Helen Thompson, led a study that unsurprisingly was paid for by Syngenta, the manufacturer of neonics, which showed that neonicotinoids are not affecting bees. My, not long after that study was pub published, she jumped the ship and went to work for Syngenta. Um, and from Europe, and this is an analysis that I became, it was published last year and I became aware of it just last week. It was an analysis of by an, uh, a non-governmental organisation in Europe 67% of the scientists who sit on the scientific committees of the European Union and, uh, and assess the impacts of chemicals have direct links to the industries whose chemicals are being assessed. 
So either, either receiving money directly from those industries or their research organisations are. Now, this is a bit of a shock to many of us because we've always held up the European Union system as better than anybody else's. And in fact, it is better than anybody else's. But even so, 67% of those, pesticide, those scientists are highly compromised. 31 pesticides with endocrine disrupting properties were about to be um, banned in the European Union on the basis of a scientific paper showing the problems, but the paper got buried by top commission officials under pressure from the industry. And to this day, despite the fact the European Union has passed laws uh, that say that uh, pesticides with endocrine disrupting pest, uh, properties have to be banned, they haven't been, because there is this ongoing fight with industry and now also the US government under the guise of a trade agreement um, to prevent the EU actually putting this into place. And the EU has not apparently got the ability to stand up for its own legislation. There's a third example coming a lot closer to home, in fact to Wellington, and this is the, our very own EPA. In 2012, the EPA carried out an assessment of organophosphate insecticides, including chlorpyrifos. There were a lot of things wrong with the assessments, including the fact that it didn't um, assess the persistence and bioaccumulation of chlorpyrifos, even though it is one of the most um, widespread contaminants in the Arctic, more widespread than DDT and the other so-called persistent organic pollutants, more widespread than endosulfan that got banned in 2012-11 globally because of its contamina contamination of the Arctic environment. Chlorpyrifos contamination is worse. Our EPA chose not to look at persistence and bioaccumulation at all, despite the fact that I gave them a huge amount of information on it. They didn't think it was relevant. And anyway, if it was going to be banned uh, internationally, that would be some years away so we can keep on using it in the meantime. How responsible is that? Um, but more to the point, or another point, in my submission to the EPA, I gave them chemical and non-chemical alternatives, and I don't normally do this for chemical alternatives, but I was pretty clear that we had to get rid of this one from our country. I gave them chemical and non-chemical alternatives that are being used currently by New Zealand farmers for every single use of chlorpyrifos that the EPA had been able to identify. And the EPA's response was, some farmers say they need to use chlorpyrifos, then there are no alternatives. So therefore there are benefits to keeping it registered so they can continue using it. So chlorpyrifos is still widely used in this country, hardly any improvement in its regulation at all, because some farmers don't want to use alternatives. So if anybody tries to tell you, or me, that the pesticides in this country or anywhere else are safe because the regulatory system has assessed them, as Professor Seralini said this morning, this is hogwash. He didn't say that word, but I will say the word. They're not safe for children, they're not safe for the ecosystem, they're not safe for society as a whole. They're not safe for farmers, and they're not safe for their agroecosystems. They're undermining the very basis of that which, upon which they're trying to farm. They're not necessary. There are very much better ways of managing pests and weeds and diseases that enhance the ecosystem, that honour pests, that, sorry, that honour pests, that, um, that honour the future of our children and are better for our economy. And we're going to hear more of this from other speakers tomorrow, I'm pleased to be able to say. There is some good news. Internationally, particularly at the UN level, there is very, there's now a very clear recognition that highly hazardous pesticides, which is a subset of pesticides, but quite a large subset, are causing huge problems and they have to go. They have to be phased out. And there is now a proposal to form a global alliance to phase out highly hazardous pesticides. And this involves UN agencies, governments, NGOs, scientists and industry if they want to be part of phasing out their own pesticides. Um, Unfortunately, the bad news is that New Zealand's government appears to be not the slightest bit interested in this process and probably, in fact, doesn't even know that this global alliance is being formed. And if there is someone here from the EPA um, today, I would really like to know if they are aware of this uh, process. Um, it would be very interesting to know. So just in concluding, there needs to be massive and very rapid change in the thinking of our elected representatives and the bureaucracy, if we're going to avoid ecosystem collapse altogether, the dumbing down of our children and the mounting social problems that come with it. And I'm going to leave you now with very prophetic words from Rachel Carson, written in 1962, long before the neonicotinoids were invented or released upon us. <laughs> 